that even mean, Bowers Game Corner? Well, hey there, YouTube. I'm back again today for another How to Play video. And today, I'm going to teach you how to play Twilight Inscription for Fantasy Flight Games. This is for one to eight players. It'll take you 90 minutes to 120 minutes to play. Now, the first thing I want to mention is I'm going to teach you how to play the three to eight player version of the game first with the modified one and two player version of the game at the end of this. But you do need to watch everything. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is hand out all these components to each player. So each player is going to get one dry erase marker. And once everyone has one, you can set those rest back into the box. Each player is going to get one player reference card, which is double-sided, so everyone will get that. Each player is going to get three, uh, randomly, of these faction cards right here, which we'll talk about in a second. The rest can go back in the box. You're going to set aside the Mechatol Rex board. We'll come back to this a little bit later. But then make sure every player has four of these boards right here. And the four types of boards are Industry, Expansion, Warfare, and Navigation. So make sure each player has one of these. And make sure they're all on the same side. Either the A side or the B side. And decide right now which side of the sheet every player is going to use. If you'd like everyone to have their own asymmetric board, then you use side A. And if you'd like everyone to have the exact same boards, you'll use side B. Any extra boards can be put back into the box. Now that every player has their components, each player is going to decide which one of the three factions they would like to be. And on the faction cards, you're going to have two main abilities. The one at the top is a always active special ability that your faction has. And if it has the words set up on that part, then each player should resolve that card and what it says right now. On the bottom is a special ability that you will get to trigger throughout the game, but we'll talk more about that later. So right now, each player pick one of their cards, place it in front of them and set the other cards into the box. Now we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about your player area in a minute, but right now I want to talk about how you're going to set up the rest of the game. Now we're going to set up the event deck, which are all these numbered cards over here. And this is a really simple system. What you're going to do is you're going to place a blue five on the bottom. Then you're going to place a black five on top of that. And then a blue five. And then a black five. And then a blue four. And then a black four. And you do that all the way until you should have a blue one on the top of your deck. And just like that, your event deck is prepared. Next, you're going to grab the Mechatol Rex board. And you're going to set this in the center as well. Now, this side is used if you're playing a one- or two-player game. So for this example, we're actually going to flip it to the other side for a three- to eight-player game. And one thing you'll notice is there's lots of outlines around the outside for cards. So let's talk about what cards are going to go outside the Mechatol Rex board. The first thing we're going to do are these agenda cards right here, which will have either a two, a three, or a four on the bottom. You're going to take one random two, place it right there, one random three, place it right there, and one random four, and place it right there. The rest of the cards can go back in the box. Your event deck is going to be set right here. And then you're going to go through these double-sided objective cards. And then you're going to randomly grab four of these objective cards, making sure you have one of each different color. So this color is blue, so I know it would go right here on this blue spot. And you're going to want to make it so that there's two numbers at the bottom as opposed to one number at the bottom. So that blue one would go in the blue spot. This green one would go in the green spot. A yellow one in the yellow spot. And a red one in the red spot. Rest of these cards, back into the box. Last but not least, you're going to shuffle up this Relic deck and place it to the left of the Mechatol Rex board, and then give this double-sided speaker card to whoever knows the game best. So this is what the center area of the table is going to look like, but now let's take you to a player area, and then we'll show you how to play the game. So each player's area should look roughly like this with your four boards set out, your faction, your player reference card, and if you're the speaker, the speaker card in front of you right now. But now let's start the game, and I'll show you how it works. So the speaker is generally going to be the person who flips over the top event card to start off the beginning of each round. And then you're going to read them out loud and you're going to follow them step by step. Now there's a couple different events that will happen throughout the game, but the one you're going to see the most often are what are called strategy events. So let's go over those and then we'll get into how the boards work. So when you get a strategy event, the first thing you're going to do is the speaker is going to read it out loud. So choose active sheet and spend this card's resources. What this means is each player is now going to individually choose which of their four boards they want to utilize for this round. And to start off the round, they are then going to mark on whichever sheet they chose the symbols that are on the card. And this will be much clearer in a minute. So once each player has done that, the game recommends setting down your marker on the board or next to that board. Once everybody has their marker down, you move on to the next step of the strategy phase, which is to have the speaker roll these six dice right here. 
And then whatever symbols come up on the dice, you can then spend on that same board that you chose to utilize this event. But before that makes much sense, let's go ahead and explain all four boards. First, we're going to talk about the navigation board. And this is the board that the game recommends you fill in on your first strategy event if you're newer to the game. So let's talk about how you're going to use the dice on this particular board. And it's up here in the upper left-hand corner. It says if you turn in a purple symbol or a green symbol, you're going to get to explore one adjacent system. That's as simple as just drawing a line on these little dotted lines that are called hyperlanes. The rule with this is you have to draw a line either from an explored system or a hyperlane that already has orange filled in. So right now, if I wanted to explore on my navigation board, I could go here, here, or here. And in this particular example, since this was our first event card and it has three of the purple symbols, this could actually be what I did because I explored one, two, three adjacent systems. And if that happened to be what I chose to do, then I would just set down my marker and then I would wait for everyone else to get done for the speaker to roll the dice. Now, the other action you can take on the navigation board is you can claim explored systems if you have a blue symbol to spend. And that's really as simple as circling a system. But you have to make sure that you have a hyperlane that's filled in connected to it. So right at this very moment on this board, if I had a blue symbol to spend, I could circle this one, this one, or that one. Because I have hyperlanes that are connected to them. So anytime you circle something on any of your four boards, those are called assets. And there's two types of assets in the game. First, there are assets which have dotted lines, like this triangle right here. Anytime you circle an asset with dotted lines, that means you gain that immediately. Whereas if the asset has a dashed line, then that asset is available to you whenever you would like it during a strategy phase. So going back to my navigation example, I circled this dotted line right here, which means I should have gained this commodity already, but for teaching purposes, I'm not going to do that yet. Now, there's lots of other different symbols on the navigation board, and every single one of these symbols is covered on your player reference card. So if you're not sure, check here. But there are a couple special locations that I do want to spotlight. First, we have Mechatol Rex. If you claim Mechatol Rex by circling it then you're going to gain victory points and you're going to gain voting power. So how this works is it's a pretty much a race. So the first person to get to Mechatol Rex is going to put their faction's name in this spot right here, and they are going to gain that many victory points, and they'll gain that many votes. And you're going to mark this on your player board. So the first thing I'd do is I'd write Mentac up here, because that's my faction. And then I'd see that I gained seven victory points. So to show that, I'm going to put the seven right there. We're going to pretend that I did that legally. And then I also gain four votes. What that means is I'm going to go down here to my industry board, and I'm just going to circle four of these check marks right here. Those are votes I can use later, but we'll talk about that later. The next person to hit up Mechatol Rex is going to gain five victory points and four votes, and there's diminishing returns as you go. The next symbol I want to spotlight are these yellow symbols right here, and these are called relic spots. And if you ever claim a relic explored system, you're going to immediately draw one of the face-down relic cards. And these will give you powerful one-time effects, and they're also going to be worth victory points. And just like Mechatol Rex, you're going to write the amount of victory points you earn on the navigation board so if I were to gotten this relic, it's going to get me four points in addition to giving me an awesome special power. So don't sleep on these spots. Now, the last thing I want to spotlight on the navigation board are these wormholes right here. Wormholes offer a shortcut to distant territory and access to rare assets, but players must unlock the gravity drive technology in order to utilize them. Now, we're going to get more in detail about tech upgrades in a couple minutes. But to explore through a wormhole, the player traces a solid line into a wormhole, like so. And then they immediately pop out of a different wormhole. So I could legally go from here to there. And this line right here would only cost one of my purple or green dice. And that's pretty much all you need to know about the navigation board's top. Now let's take a look at the bottom right here. And we're going to talk about tech upgrades each board has two tech upgrades, and it's really quite simple. If you'd like to gain a technology for a sheet, you just have to mark the symbols on it when it's your active board. 
So to get one of these tech upgrades down here, I would either need to turn in three green symbols, and you don't have to do this all at once, you could do it over the course of a couple turns, or a yellow or blue science asset. And you can gain these on some of the other different boards, typically. Once you have either this side or this side marked off of a tech upgrade, though, you immediately gain that tech upgrade and could use it this turn if it's viable. Now, two more things to mention about tech upgrades. First, if it says per active, you can only do it once per event, assuming you activated that particular board. Also, there's no discounts. So let's pretend that you've already spent two greens down here to try and get this integrated economy, and then you happen to get the yellow symbol and you just say, right, I'm just going to use this yellow symbol and cross it off. You don't get these two green back. They're just spent and gone. The last thing I want to talk about on the navigation board are these three dice symbols down here, and you'll notice they're on each and every one of your boards. This just shows you which of the extra bonus dice you're going to be able to utilize, and you'll be able to unlock these in a variety of different ways which is a nice segue over to the expansion board. So if you choose to use the expansion as your active board for an event, it's really quite simple. All you're gonna do is whatever symbols you happen to get for that turn, you're going to mark off on these different planets or on these space docks right here. But in order to unlock the planets on your board, you're gonna have to have an explored planet asset. So right now, since we haven't earned any of the planet assets, we couldn't actually mark on any of the four planets on our expansion board. We could only mark on the space stocks. So let's talk about those first. The space stocks, much like the tech, are an either or sort of thing. You either have to pay one planet or a bunch of symbols in order to unlock an extra die slot. So let's show you how that works. Let's pretend that on our turn we actually had three greens. We marked off all three of those. And once again, you don't have to do it on one turn. You could do it over the course of numerous turns. But now that I got those three greens marked off, I would circle this blue asset die. And since it's a dashed line, I can spend it whatever I want. But I want to spend it now. So I go ahead and I cross off that asset, which is once again to give me an extra die that I can use on my sheets. What this means is I can either fill in my blue extra die here, 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 or here. Because when the speaker rolls the dice, Everyone gets to use the symbols on the black die. However, you only get to use the symbols on the blue, pink, and green dice if you've unlocked it for that particular board. So just to clarify, if my boards looked like this, I would get to use all six dice every time I activated the expansion board. I would get to use three black die and one blue die on the navigation board. I would get to use three black dice, a blue die, and a green die on the warfare board. And let's pretend on industry I've completely not done anything. And on the industry board, I would only get to use the three black dice. So those are space docks. But now let's go back to these planets here and explain these a little bit better. So we're going to cheat a little bit and we're going to pretend like we actually do have one explored system right here that we have not turned in. And since it's part of the strategy phase right now, I can cross off this planet asset, and then I get to cross off one of the planets, or I could just mark off a space dock and get myself an extra die if I wanted to, but that's not what we're doing right now. So let's pretend that we are going to get Cornique, so we would mark that off right here, we'd mark it off right there, and now we can use the symbols on the dice to start marking off these spots in the center. And how this works is really quite simple. If you can mark off all the symbols on a row or a column, then you're going to gain the benefit on the top or right side. So let's pretend for this example, I marked off blue, blue, green. Well, then guess what? I now circle that immediately, and that's a science asset I can use now or in the future. And if I happen to use it now, and I happen to use it on this very board right here, by crossing off this technology, then yes, I would get to use this tech right now. Now, there's one symbol I'd like to spotlight on the expansion board, which is this one right here. That is called your population. And you see you have a track over here on the right side. And pretty much this track is just going to get you victory points. And I do want to remind you this is a great way to get victory points. And yes, it is totally legal to get two things on the expansion board at one time. So, for instance, if I marked right here, I would get both this and this because I completed both the row and the column. That's totally legal. The only other thing to spotlight on the expansion board is this resource tracker right here. 
This is completely optional to use. You don't have to use it at all, but this is just an easy way to keep track of the resources you have from turn to turn to turn to turn to turn because this game has a lot of dominoes and you might push one domino and end up gaining resources in a variety of different ways. And it's just a nice little bookkeeping tool to use if you'd like. The big thing to remember is you cannot start marking on a planet until you have crossed out the planet symbol on the bottom left of it. Next, we have the industry board, which looks really complex, but it's actually four separate areas just on one sheet. So for right now, we're just going to focus on this area right here and the four actions you can take when you activate the industry board. The first two actions and the main actions are either to scrap one of these spaces or claim a space. To scrap a space, you're going to spend a purple symbol and you're going to mark an X through any one of these circles as long as you're connected to it. And everyone starts with one X on their industry sheet. So if I wanted to scrap an unmarked space on this particular board, I could scrap any of those ones right there because they're right next to my X. Now, when you scrap a space, you are essentially saying, I will never get that resource. But scrapping spaces is necessary because the other action you can take that's a big one is you can claim one unmarked space adjacent to a scrap space. You'll do this by turning in either a blue or a green symbol. And once again, I could claim any of these spaces right here. And just like all the other boards, when you claim a space, you're going to gain that asset, which I am going to explain next. But first, let's talk about the two extra actions you can take. First, you can spend a blue science tech and you can spend up to four of the purple symbols, or you can spend a yellow tech and you can spend up to three of the blue symbols. Now, the other thing I want to mention about the industry board are these weird X's that were also on the board. These X's can be unlocked with science technology. So let's go back to this red tech up here that I have not utilized. If I wanted to, I could mark out this asset and then that could potentially unlock this X right here, which would give me access to these three symbols. I want to mention that there are some spots that will give you double resources. So just a heads up on that. And no, you can never scrap and claim the same spot. Once you scrap it, it's scrapped forever. Once you claimed, it's claimed forever. So that's the industry board. But you'll notice there's a lot of other stuff going on on this board. So let's talk about the three other spaces on this board. All right, let's go to the bottom. This is called your commodity track, and it's super important. So whenever you gain a commodity, you are going to mark off the leftmost commodity of that symbol. So going back up to my navigation board, I claimed this blue one right here, which means what I should have done is marked out that leftmost blue one right there. Now, this is important for a couple reasons. First and foremost, you can get a whole bunch of victory points by focusing on this board. And if you ever fill in enough commodities that you get next to one of these victory point symbols right here, you just immediately circle and that's victory points you're going to get for the end of the game. However, if you evenly diversify your portfolio, you're going to gain a whole bunch of trade goods because if you are able to complete an entire column of this area down here, then you're going to gain trade goods during what's called the trade event phase. So let me show you how that works. So pretty much if I were on the industry board and I decided that I wanted to claim this yellow right here, I would immediately mark off the leftmost yellow as per normal. But then since this column is completely filled in with only one yellow, I would now mark down here that I'm going to start earning trade goods. Later on in the game, if I were able to circle this red and circle this yellow, then I would mark off this red and this yellow. And now I'm going to start earning two trade goods. And once again, you don't get the trade goods now. You'll get them a little bit later. Also, if you happen to get all the way over to the right side and start circling these victory points, you don't gain anything else after you do that. Moving to the left, we have storage space where you're going to store your trade goods and your votes. And we will come back to these areas when we get to those event phases in a couple minutes. Last but not least, you're going to have a spot right here, which is going to keep track of how many votes you're going to earn during voting phases. And you'll gain more of these by gaining this asset right here. So now we're going to talk about the Warfare Board. And if you choose to activate the Warfare Board during a strategy event, what you're going to do is you're going to be using the symbols on the dice to build units, which are going to go into this area right here. 
So going back to this strategy card, I start off with three purple symbols right here, which means I could, if I wanted to, mark off all three of these symbols right here. And since I've done that, I now immediately unlock one point, but I also gain a cruiser. A cruiser is going to be three dotted lines right next to each other. Each dotted line that you're going to put on your warfare board is going to be worth one strength. And during warfare events, you are going to compare your strength with the player to your left and the player to your right. Those players, you're going to gain rewards, and if you lose, you're going to lose a victory point. If there's a tie, then nobody gets anything. And we'll go more into that when we get to the warfare phase. Right now, we're going to focus on how you mark on this board, though. So I need to place my cruiser, and let's go over the rules of placing one of your units. First, the shape can be rotated and flipped. So this would be totally legal, or this would be totally legal, but I just couldn't make a diagonal. Also, the unit I'm placing must be above what's called the deployment line. And the deployment line is going to move as you progress through the game, but for right now, the deployment line is always going to start at the bottom here, and it's pre-drawn, as you can see. The next placement rule you need to know is that your unit cannot be placed over what's called an anomaly spot, which are these red spots scattered throughout the warfare board. Next, you'll notice that there's some assets that you can claim around this board, and how that works is really quite simple. Let's go back to this example where I was making a cruiser. If I wanted to, I could do this, this, and then instead of placing a dot here, I would just circle that, meaning I had one victory point. But for all intents and purposes, this circled asset also counts as one strength. So to clarify, right now, if we were to get into a warfare event, I would have two strength against the player to my left because they're on this side of the board. And I would have one strength against the player on my right because it's on the right side of the board. It's also super important to note that this three strength I have right now is only going to be active during the first warfare. Once we get to another warfare, we're going to get ourselves a new deployment line, and any units underneath that deployment line are no longer going to give me strength. Now, a couple more minor rules that I want to mention on the warfare board. Just like everything else, pretty much, you don't have to fill in everything all at once. So, for instance, on this cruiser, if I only had two purple symbols, I could just mark off those two purple symbols, and I can come back later and fill that in to gain the cruiser. Also, if you want to unlock the Dreadnought or War Sun units, you're going to have to spend a science asset in able to unlock them. Also, there are a finite number of units that you're going to be able to allow to use on your Warfare board. You only get four cruisers, four Dreadnoughts, two War Suns. Except when it comes to infantry. You can have as many infantry as you want on your board. Now, another major rule to know on the Warfare board is that when you're placing a unit, part of the ship must be in the first row of nodes above a deployment line or adjacent to another unit that is. So, for instance, this move right here would not be legal because we are not touching the bottom line. However, if we had placed an infantry right here first, that would be totally legal. For example, we could put a PDS right here, and this would still be totally legal because we're adjacent to this cruiser right there. But now that we've talked about all four of the different boards, we can talk about the different events, and we can talk about the ways you can score, and then you can get in the game. So in the game, grand total, there are four different types of event cards. So the first one we've already alluded to are the strategy event cards. And once again, these are as simple as choosing your active sheet, spending the resources on the card, the speaker's going to roll the dice, and then you spend the resources on the die. And when you're done with that, you place your marker down to let everybody know that you're done. And once everybody's done, you flip over the next card. Now, one last major rule that I want to mention is that you shouldn't be looking at other players' boards when a marker is in your hand, typically. And what I mean by that is, during the round, while you're filling out what you want to do on your boards, you shouldn't be looking at anyone else's boards. However, once you're done, that's when you can look at other players' boards. Easy peasy. Now, production events are also very simple. On your turn, you're going to claim trade goods on industry for each unlocked icon on your industry chart. So once again, those are those right down here at the bottom. So in this particular production event, I would get two trade goods. So I'd go over here 
and circle two trade goods. And then the production event is over. They're really quite simple. Now, when it comes to trade goods, they are amazing. We haven't talked too much about them yet, but all you need to know about a trade good is it's pretty much a wild dice face. So you could use this as the blue symbol, the green symbol, or the purple symbol. You cannot use it as a science symbol. And also, you can use as many trade goods as you want on a turn. The catch is that after you use a trade good, you just mark it off to let you know that you don't have it anymore. Next, we have council events, and it says claim one vote on industry for each unlocked vote icon. So the first thing you do is you look up here on this track right here, and as many of these you have marked, that's how many votes you're going to circle over on your industry board. Then flip and vote on the stage two agenda. So for that to make sense, we're going to need to bring Mechatol Rex back down and flip over this card right here, which as we can see is a stage two voting card. Now, this is primarily going to be handled by the speaker, who will flip over their speaker card and follow the rules on the back of the card. So first, read the agenda, open the debate. Everyone is going to secretly cast their votes, and you'll use this board right here that's really quite simple. You just decide how many votes you want to utilize. So let's just say I'm going to utilize three votes. I would write three in here, and then I would either mark that I'm going to pass or I want it to fail. And then everyone's going to reveal at the same time. You can also abstain from voting by just writing a zero. You'll tally the votes on this spot right here on the Mechatol Rex board. And then you're either going to resolve the pass or the fail side of the card. Now, if there's a tie, you're going to roll a black die. If it comes up with this one, that means pass. If it comes up with any of the other results, that means fail. But regardless of whether or not your vote passed or failed, you still spend the votes by marking them off on your board. And then you're done with the council phase. And as you can see from up here, you are going to have three council events that you'll be voting on throughout the game. Then the last type of event cards you're going to have are warfare cards. And you will see this card four times throughout the game in rounds two, three, four, and five. You will never have warfare during round one. But like the other events, you're just going to follow the instructions on the card. First thing you're going to do is advance to the deployment line. What that means is if your original deployment line is still down here, you're just going to boop, move on to the next line. So for instance, if this was the round three event card, we would then be moving the deployment line up to here. Then you're going to resolve a war against each neighbor using the sections immediately below the deployment line. So what this means is all my dots above this deployment line, I would not get to use in this warfare, but they will come in handy next warfare. But for now, I would see that I have two strength on my left because I have two dots right here, and I have zero strength on my right. Once I've written these numbers down, I'm then going to talk to the players on my left and the player on my right to see if I've won. If I've won, then I get to circle the top asset, which is normally going to be pretty stinking good. If you lost, then you circle the bottom one, which is always going to be negative one victory point. And if it's a tie, then you don't get anything. And one thing I want to mention that I haven't mentioned yet is one specific symbol that you'll see scattered throughout the galaxy, which is this neighbor symbol right here. And this one will allow you to gain strength during each war against either the player on your left or the player on your right. And the arrow will point to whichever way that is. So don't forget to calculate that into your warfare total. And the other thing that I really want to clarify here is that right now, my strength in the second quadrant would be one on the right and four on the left. I do not get any of the strength from anything down here, though. So we've covered the boards. We've covered the events. The only thing we have left to talk about is the end game scoring and how you tally up your points. And tallying up your points is really quite simple. The first thing you're going to look at is how many objective card points you received. Now, we haven't talked about this much yet, so let's talk about it right now. At the beginning of the game, you set up four random objectives. Now, this aspect of the game was a race, because as soon as you completed an objective, you announce it to everyone else, and then you write the number of points that you earned on your board. So, for instance, let's pretend that I completed this collector navigation event, and I was the first person to do it. I would immediately put nine above the objective spot on my navigation board. Now, if anyone else at the table completes that particular objective during the same step of a round, then they would all get that maximum number of points. However, anyone after this phase of the round is only going to get 
five points. So after everyone's gotten their big chunk of points, you flip that card over, and then it will stay that way for the rest of the game. So with objectives, as soon as you complete it, you just tell everybody, you mark it down. So for this particular scoring example, let's pretend that we were in first place on our navigation board. Unfortunately, we only got second place on the industry board, which means we'd also have three points on our industry objective. And then we did not complete warfare or expansion, so we would put zero on expansion and zero on warfare next to the objective part. And don't forget, there are different phases to an event. So if player A was able to unlock this expansion objective after everyone has chosen the active sheet and spent the resources on the card, but then player B is able to complete that same objective, but only after the speaker has rolled the dice and then they've spent the dice resources, then only player A would get the big bonus, whereas player B would get the smaller bonus on the backside of the card. But once you've got all your objective scoring done, the only thing you have to do now is look at your sheets and then count up the number of points on your sheet. And once again, you're looking for the star symbols. So right now on my navigation board, the only star symbol I circled would be the seven points on Megatar Rex. So I put seven on top of sheet, and then my subtotal would be nine plus seven, aka 16 points on my navigation board. The only minor thing I want to mention about scoring is don't forget to tally up your trade goods as well. I think that's an easily missable one on the industry board. And you get one victory point for every two trade goods that you didn't utilize. And that does not round up. So three trade goods would equal one victory point for your industry board. The player with the most victory points spread across all four of the boards will be the winner of the galaxy. If there's a tie, the tied player with the most claimed votes remaining wins the game. If there's still a tie, the tied players establish a coalition and share the victory. Last but not least, I'm just going to place this clarifications page from the back page of the rule book right here. This will cover a lot of situational rules that might come up, but if I added those all to the video, it would add like 10 to 15 extra minutes. But I'll leave it right here and you can pause it if you need it. And that's how you're going to play Twilight Inscription. If this helped you out, please consider giving it a thumbs up. That really helps me out. Also consider subscribing. But if you're playing a one or two player version of the game, let's talk about how that modifies the rules. So in the lower player count versions of the game, you're not going to use this side of Megatol Rex. You're actually going to flip it over to the other side where you're going to have an AI faction that you're going to be going against. The next thing that's going to be different is that instead of having one voting card under each of the three spots under Mechatol Rex, you're actually going to put all the voting cards underneath there and just shuffle them up and place them into their corresponding piles. Next, if you're in a two-player game, you're going to want to determine your neighbor. So the speaker's going to roll a black die, and on an end result, the speaker's going to be the other player's left neighbor for the game, and on any other result, the speaker will be to the right of their neighbor, and this matters for warfare. So once you've established whether or not you're on the left or the right of your opponent, you're going to choose a difficulty for the AI faction. If you're playing on easy mode, there will be no changes to this board. If you want to play the medium mode, you're going to cross out the leftmost icon on each of the four gold tracks right here, like so. And if you're playing on hard mode, you're going to cross off the two most left items on the gold track, and you're also going to cross out the leftmost unmarked icon on the stage two and stage three sections of the strength and vote track, which are right here. So essentially, you'd mark off four squares, which are these four right there. But that's the difference in the setup, so let's talk about what's different with the gameplay and how this board works. And it's really quite simple. So first, we'll talk about what's different during a strategy event. After rolling the dice during a strategy event, the speaker is going to mark the AI's progress on the Mechatol Rex sheet. For each focus die, the speaker crosses out the leftmost unmarked icon on the track that matches the die's result. So for instance, if this was our die roll right here, we would mark off this green, this one blue, and this one pink. Likewise, if we had come up with the two blue, we would mark this one, we would actually mark this one down here. But that's all you're going to do different during the strategy phase. Now, each of the gold tracks has one or more goals, such as a specific objective, displayed within the track. Once the AI gets all the way to one of these goals, you're going to circle it, and then you're immediately going to have the bad thing that it does happen. So this one says Mechatol Rex, and what this just means is the AI faction has reached Mechatol Rex. And so the amount of points that I could get is going to go down. 
Likewise down here, you'll see navigation, industry, warfare, and expansion. That just correlates to these cards right now. So essentially, if the AI were to get to this navigation objective right here, then we would immediately flip the navigation card, which means now no one is going to be able to get the big nine point bonus for completing that. We'll have to settle for only the five points. And if the AI ever gets all the way to the end of one of these tracks, then you look at the symbols on the right hand side and you use those instead. So let's just pretend our entire navigation board was filled, yet we still rolled another of this symbol right here. Well, as it shows right here, we would just now treat this symbol like it's that, but only in the context of the AI board. We don't physically flip the die. And in this particular instance, that means we'd go with a one pink symbol and we would mark off this one on here instead. Next, when you get to war events, the AI is going to have a strength, and that strength is represented on this track right here. You'll also notice that they'll have a different strength for Warfarers 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, if you're playing a two-player game, the AI faction will be on whatever side your opponent is not on. And if you're playing a solo game, then the AI faction's strength will be on both your left and your right side when it comes to warfare counting. But after you're done resolving a war event, draw a line through any unmarked icon in that stages section of the track. And then from that point on, you could pretty much just ignore all this because you're going to be focusing on round three warfare. Nothing changes during production events, and the AI faction does not get any trade goods, so you don't have to worry about that. So last but not least, let's talk about the council events and what's different. So when you get to a council event, the first thing you're going to do is draw the first agenda from the face-down pile. For whichever phase of the game we're in. So we're going to pretend we're in phase two, so we'd flip over the top card of the pile. And then you're actually going to tuck it underneath the speaker card so that only the pass side is able to be seen, like so. Next, you're going to draw cards from that deck until you get a card to put on the bottom that either does or does not have a star. Now, how you know whether or not you want a star on the bottom is by looking at the top. So you see on this past one, we actually have a star on the top, which means that whatever's going to go under here on the bottom that's going to be a fail is not going to have a star. So for instance, if we were to draw this card next, we would not use it because it's a fail with a star. So we draw the next one and we can see it's a fail without a star. So then we would tuck it underneath the speaker card and bada boom, we have our pass fail condition for this event. Next, the players are going to cast their votes, but they do not mark pass or fail. You're just going to choose any number of votes that you'd like to utilize. So next, the speaker is going to look at the voting section of the Mechatol Rex board, which is right underneath the Warfare section right here. And similar to how we did in Warfare, they're going to mark off any votes that the AI faction didn't utilize. So let's pretend that the AI faction was at two votes. The first thing the speaker would do here is mark off these votes because we're not going to use them. And then they're going to roll one black die. And as you can see from the iconography on the card, this black die, depending on how you roll it, is either going to add zero or up to two votes to the AI faction's voting power. And then you resolve the outcome. So each player who casts more votes than the AI is going to resolve the outcome that has the star. So in this case, it would be the pass. And each player who did not cast more votes than the AI is going to resolve the outcome that does not have a star icon. So the icons with a star are always going to be good, and the icons without the star are always going to be bad. But other than that, you still mark off the votes on your board as per normal. And once you're done, you can discard the cards. And the player with the most points wins the game, but only if you do better than this little chart right here. But that's how you're going to play Twilight Inscription. If this helped you out, please consider subscribing or supporting the Patreon. But go have some fun and thanks for your time. YouTube. This video is brought to you by all of my amazing Patreon supporters. And I would love it if you would join their ranks and have your name immortalized in the end of many of my videos for the end of time. But consider for only a dollar a month. And as always, thanks for stopping by.